this uh, sort of a takeoff from uh, an article I wrote this summer that kind of gained, gained feed, I guess it did. Anyway, it was called The Miniature Gardens in the Cracks of the Sidewalk. And Master Naturalist members sent me photos of sidewalk crack plants. I know that sounds like it's a druggie, but it's not. <clears throat> anyway, uh, sent me plants to identify that were coming up in their various yards. And you can read that if you'd like. There's a, you can take a picture of anything that's on the screen there, but that's, uh, it's on our chapter website. The pictures on this slide were sent to me uh, by Joseph Connors, who is our chapter webmaster. And it, it's a perfect example of a sidewalk crack plant there. You can see with that great big yellow arrow. So all the other photos in the uh, presentation are mine. And you're welcome to take a picture of this slide as well. These are my primary resources for uh, doing this presentation. And you'll note at the bottom links, most of my identifications were made via photographs uploaded to iNaturalist.org, which is a worldwide database where experts mostly confirm your ident identifications. So my presentation tonight is mostly about, as Jan said, identifying those random, possibly annoying plants that come up willy-nilly and seeing how they might benefit wildlife and then help you to decide what you might want to keep or maybe just keep for a little while. I wanted to get your attention with something beautiful right off the bat. It isn't, I, I just think this is awesome. Look at the symmetry, the basket weed effect of the rest receptacle, those pollen rich spikes of a stunning lavender pink pom pom. I'd never seen anything like it. Well, I got a boat for my birthday one year. It's a pedal boat. I love it. We tie it to a palm tree when it's not in the water. I want you to note where the star is in that right photo. During one winter, where that yellow star was, a small rosette began to appear under the boat next to the palm tree. And I discovered it May, 2020. I knew it wasn't the rosette of a Texas thistle and not wanting to miss anything, I waited it out. And I was richly rewarded one year later in May of 2021. It's bristle thistle in all its mature glory, happily blooming away, still under that boat. I'd flagged it so I wouldn't nick it with the string weeder. As wicked looking as those leaves are, bristle thistle is larva, a larval host to little metal mark and painted lady butterflies. The flowers are rich in nectar. They're a source for butterflies, bees, hummingbirds. Beetles eat the flowers. The seeds are rich in oil and an important food source for seed eating birds. The blooms are short lived and quickly turn to seed. The flower stalk withers and drops like a wet dish rag, as you can see in the bottom right corner. Bristle thistle is a North American species. It's in the thistle tribe within the sunflower family. It has large taproot and fleshy side roots that sometimes sprout new shoots. It can be an annual or a biennial and is native to the eastern and southern United States. I let it go seed and have had one or two new plants in subsequent years. It's not invasive in Texas and easy enough to get rid of before it develops. The first mystery plant that we had on our property when we moved to San Benito in 2010 turned out to be Berlandier's trumpets. I didn't know this for a long time because I'd yet to learn to discover Texas master naturalists. This plant comes up between the cracks of pavement quite nicely and also along the edges of sidewalks. It seemed to be only leaves. Those early years, I would work in the yard most of the day and then come in in the evening. As the days got longer, I'd go out in the evenings and wander around. One evening, I was fascinated, or actually astonished, to see blooms in those bunches of leaves. The plant is fairly prolific, although I have never actually seen a seed pod, so I'm not really sure what's on with that. I keep most of those plants that appear. I don't think they hurt anything, at least as far as I know they don't. They weren't even stunned by the great freeze of 2021. By the way, it's a vine. Although the ones on the pavement don't seem to travel much over 18 inches, this one planted itself at the base of a big honey mesquite. At four o'clock every evening, Berlandier's trumpets faithfully open. They close by sunrise the next morning. It's one of the night blooming plants I mentioned when I encourage people to consider adding moth attracting plants to their butterfly 
or pollinator garden because Berlandier's trumpet is a larval host plant for the white line sphinx moth. Most of my moth photos you'll see in this presentation were taken from moths visiting my black light moth sheet set up pictured in the left uh, at the bottom left. Throughout this presentation, you're gonna wonder why I keep some of the upstart plants when people really think they're just gonna be an annoying little weed. Well, mainly it's because they might be nourishment for some sort of wildlife. You never know what might be passing through. This summer, I finally saw another quail again this year. And then not that I ever tried to attract wild turkey, it was pretty exciting to have a female real grand wild turkey visit us this spring and summer. You might note that some of the food choices of some of uh, which we keep around. Do any of you ever find things happen when you aren't looking? One particularly wet spring, 2015, I didn't start yard work because it was just so wet. When I did go out, I realized what a poor decision that had been. That spring, here's what happened. An entire bank of yellow flowers instantly sprung up. It was like one morning, there they were. This was prior to iNaturalist.org, and I spent quite a while page, paging through, page by page, Ken King's and Dr. Richardson's book, Plants of Deep South Texas. A brief backstory, and this is something you might want to try for yourself at home if you like new and interesting plants on your land. In October 2013, we had to have some of our retaining walls rebuilt, and then we bought truckloads of soil just down the street on the highway in San Benito. There were lots of surprises from that venture. You'll note in the top right corner, our cats really get involved in some of the stuff we do outdoors. Well, the spring of 2014, uh, this venture brought a lot of kelp and daisy plants, but it wasn't until the following year that we had that hillside of Coreopsis. And that's what I identified them from deep plant south to deep to plants of deep south Texas. Their golden wave, Coreopsis tinctora, which is an annual. References say they can reach heights to 20 inches, bloom spring and fall, spring through fall in clumps. Now that dramatic hillside event was never repeated, but Coreopsis continue to propagate, which is fine. It's good nectar for butterflies and bees. Finches and sparrows eat the seeds. And um, I've noticed that it's, it will readily self-propagate, but it is on that wild turkey food list. One summer, while a couple of honey mesquite trees gloriously spread their branches over the upper yard next to the house, the shaded lawn began sporting things other than my beautiful St. Augustine grass. Yes, I am one of those. Um, I love St. Augustine grass, which by the way, is host to brown longtail, double dotted and pale rayed skipper butterflies. But this particular plant in the shaded grass went undetected because it was simply the same color green. I eventually identified it as straggler daisy. It's in the Astracaceae family. The flowers barely reach to a quarter of an inch and it blooms during all seasons in the valley, thriving in full sun or shade. The plant sprawls, it has one tap root and the plant can easily be pulled out of the soil with the root intact. And that's um, something to keep in mind later on in the, in the presentation. However, though, straggler daisy is a good nectar plant for butterflies and a host plant for the bordered patch butterflies. Another persistent, if not popular plant under the shade of that mesquite bough was three-lobed false mallow, also commonly called yard mallow. At first glance, it looks exciting with its dark green, small, sturdy, shapely textured leaves and bright yellow flowers like a miniature buttercup. In the valley, it's most likely to be perennial. The five petaled yellow flowers are about a quarter of an inch in diameter. They don't open until late afternoon. The plant is not native. It is an introduced species native to an island in the Caribbean. It has a tenaciously strong taproot that doesn't pull up by hand without breaking. The remaining root system, and this is really fun, the remaining root system, which very well may reach to China, will reproduce underground at the mode, the nodes. Best to loosen this one uh, with a spade or shovel. However, if you find it in the cracks of your sidewalk, 
I rather suspect it'll be yours forever. It's not without merit. It's one of the known food plants for common and tropical skippered checker, a checkered skipper, red crescent, and scrub hair streak butterflies. And the leaves are probably eaten by rabbits and Texas tortoises. Now, two of these are my favorite pictures. The one on the top left, um, I love incongruity scenes like this when nature just kind of thumbs its nose at man-made structures. In the big picture with the cat, about five years ago, we had a few of these little posies. I didn't mow the spot because I thought the vibrant violet flowers were so pretty. The cat liked to pose amongst them and I was thinking, of course, nectar for butterflies. Well, the next spring we had thousands of pretty little violet posies all over the acreage. So inadvertently it's a keeper whether or not we want it. These are oxaluses. They, uh, they have a cluster of small underground bulbs that aren't gonna pull up when you tug on the plant. I've not caught a lot of wildlife using the flowers, a butterfly once in a while, like the bordered patch in the small photo. Oxalis plants contain, interestingly enough, oxalic acid. And that can be to toxic if, can, if ingested and something to keep your cats, dogs, and horses from eating. It has no rating, <coughs> excuse me, it has no <coughs> rating on the NAB and Nectar rating guide. And speaking of that, you can take a picture of this if you'd like, if you don't know this already. Uh, it's a link to the, native, the National Butterfly NABA Nectar Hoster Plant host plant list that I just mentioned. Some plants are richer with nectar than others. And several years ago, Mike Quinn, a Texas Parks and Wildlife invertebrate biologist, now somewhere in San Antonio, I think, compiled a list of nectar ratings from fair to excellent and included butterfly host plants for the Na National Butterfly Center in Mission. And you can def download that PDF. Southern coastal rosaline is native to coastal Southern Texas. It's a native succulent with vibrant but tiny flowers, as you can see in relation to the cat's whiskers. Mostly what I can read or find about this species agrees with Ken King and Al Richardson, where they say, if you find it in your uh, garden, dig it up as quick as you can and pot it because it becomes invasive. Interestingly enough, I have not had that problem, so I leave it alone. Sometimes I have more of it than others. In deep summer, it looks almost dehydrated. I've seen bees, small butterflies, and the itty bitty inornate pyrosta red moth on the flowers. It's also something you don't want your pets to eat. It's toxic if ingested. Another little story. As fun as it is to discover new species in the yard, some plants would certainly not be on my bucket list. Most of us recall that weird year we had in 2021. On our acreage, at the first of year, we had unusually free blooming plants the first week of February, the big killer freeze the next week, and then for us, the big rains and freak Wasaka flood the third week of July. The pedal boat, by the way, escaped harm. By September, the Wasaka was finally mostly back toward its banks. I didn't weed eat along those muddy banks to see whatever was gonna come back could be counted in the Texas pollinator bio, bio blitz the first 20 days of October. And then following that was the Native Plant Society of Texas wildflower bio blitz. So the receding waters were, uh, brought some surprises and new volunteer plants all along that retaining wall. Fragrant flat sedge was the most obvious newbie, tentatively identified via iNaturalist. My first thought was how sturdy it looked. It was vibrant green in the sun, and for someone who grew up in the Midwest, that center mass was highly reminiscent of cockleburs, but they weren't. But it was shocking to discover how impossible it was to pull up by hand, even from the damp earth, even the younger of those flat sedges. The plants must develop huge, tenacious roots long before they shoot up those tough blades. The plant can grow two feet tall, and according to my research, but eradication was time consuming and I really didn't want that propagating all over the yard. The plant is not for everyone, but on a positive note, the seeds are an important food source for ducks like the American Weijin, green-winged teal, Sora, Virginia rail, and Wilson snipe, but not birds that frequent our little horseshoe rasaka. Another backstory, 
I know this looks like all I do is stand around and take pictures of my husband working, but I must say I do my fair share. Some of you may know that. Backbreaking work. He's, he's a taskmaster. But in May this year, in direct opposition to last July's Rosaka flood, the Rosaka was way low. Uh, my husband always asks me what I want for holidays and such, and I never know. But this year, I said, I want a photo perch at the end of our yard. And those uprights you see, they were already here when we moved in in 2010. They're just sitting there willy nilly, but they were solid. Before the flood had eroded some of our yard down there, I would prop my camera up on one of the end uprights and use it as an impromptu uh, tripod. But none of those uprights were true. It took us two days to get them plumbed so we could begin the build. And then it went fairly swiftly. Because the water was so low this year, that Rosaka bank that usually isn't, it was. And I was horrified, if you'll see on the, that left photo on the left of it, uh, the thigh high sedge plants lining the bank. In addition, there were a lot of critter tracks going back and forth in front of them. And so just for fun, I strapped the game camera to a piling of the new dock for a few weeks. Raccoons and big, big stray dogs used that path mostly. However, this was quite a thrill. I know, cute, huh? Look at those little ear tufts, bobcat. However, if that bank of sedges wasn't bad enough, equally horrifying was the discovery of non-native red center morning glory shrouding many of the trees behind that row of sedges. The late summer rains this year seem to have given the, those vines the impetus to bloom. Prior to that, they were just green, like the, the trees and other greenery. So they went unnoticed and it wasn't until those white flowers burst open that it called attention to its covert invasion. Red Center Morning Glory is an introduced uh, plant native to Paraguay. It's found in Cameron, Hidalgo, Star and Wilsey counties in the valley. It is not our friend. The 2021 freeze did not impair the proclivity of this vine. In fact, it seems to have, have spurred it on uh, as that near death threat made it more determined to proliferate. Those thousands of blooms produced legions of seeds. If you discover this pretty but treacherous flower in your lot yard, rip it out by the roots. Now this is a view of what that should look like. The Rotamas are still there and I've, I have rescued them. But jumping back a minute, uh, after that Rosaka flood, in contrast to those daggerish sedges of the retaining wall, I spied three tiny soft pink flowers growing close to the ground. My first explanation was, oh, how sweet. I uploaded a photo for the pollinator violet blitz and found it was a, had a gentle name, Herb of Grace. Now, just two weeks later, for the Native Plant Society of Texas bio blitz, it was far more abundant. And later still, I couldn't help to keep, but keep in mind the movie Little Shop of Horrors. That sweet little plant was so widespread and it was creeping. It's a long lived perennial in the plantain of all things family. It can be aggressive in the right conditions, wet, enjoying a substrate of organic material, translate that to muck, which is what was left when the floodwaters were receding. Herb of Grace forms extensive mats and is not fussy about soil, nor the lack of soil. It's semi-aquatic, thrives in standing water, and is native in warm wetlands in, believe it or not, most continents. It's fast-growing, long-lived, and easy to pro propagate. Just stick some cuttings in a glass of water, if you dare. There is a positive note. It's a larval host plant and nectar source for white peacock butterflies but so are other species. It attracts low-lying butterflies for nectar, but so do lots of other plants. And when the moist conditions dry up, the plant isn't so prevalent. This is a false daisy in the Astercaceae, the aster or daisy family. Um, it's a species of plant also widespread across much of the world, commonly in moist places in warm, temperate and tropical areas, kind of like the valley in a flood. Here's the scary part. This plant can grow with prostrate or ascend, ascending stems one to three feet tall and root at the stem nodes. Its habitat includes sand dunes, salt marshes, wetlands, and mudflats. 
We certainly had a mud flat. False daisy is a summer blooming annual. Hand weeding large plants is difficult due to not only rooting at the nodes, it's extensive root growth and adventitious rooting of stems. So they respond to stress conditions like flooding. On a positive note, it's maybe visited by hummingbirds, native bees, butterflies, and other insects and small mammals, according to my research. As our back slope recovered from the after effects of the last year's flood, I have been able to man maintain it, and this plant has not returned in force. And I think that's for the best. Four summers ago, I noticed a vine wending its way through the rotama tree that you saw in an earlier photo. It was climbing hempweed. It was something new, so of course I kept it, and it was well worth it, especially during the October bio blitz that year. The vine is native from Maine to Florida and westward to Texas. It attracts butterflies, bees, flies, and beetles. This photo on the left is this year's vine in that rotama tree. I had tremendous fun with the climbing hempweed, photographing hundreds of butterflies, wasps, bees, flies, and in that inset, the Harasina, Coracina moss that uh, were all over the flowers. I pulled the vine off the rotama after that fall bio blitz when it had gone to seed. The vine didn't return the second year, but this year the one in the previous photo has come up, but not nearly as dramatically. Climbing hempweed is the larval host to two local moths, the scarlet-bodied wasp moth and the confederate moth, neither of which I've had at the moth sheet. The vine is sometimes a larval host for the little metal mark butterflies. It's a keeper for now. On an April day this year, I saw something completely new. I didn't recognize it, but it had caught my attention like it had flagged me down. So I got off the lawnmower and flagged it on my way. And by early May, a beautiful surprise revealed itself. And I identified it in inaturalist.org as catchfly prairie gentian, estoma exultatum. In the Richardson King, Page 277, it's named Bluebill Gentian. The Latin estoma means open mouth and refers to the large throat of the flowers, which are purple in the bowl and lavender at the upper petals. The bell-shaped flowers are nearly three inches across and have five to seven one-inch petals. The plant has a single erect stem, uh, one to two feet tall with multiple branches of blooms. An annual, it blooms spring and summer, but all too soon dries up. I kept it intact, hoping the seeds disperse themselves, <clears throat> excuse me, for more plants next spring. I checked it in October and the seed pods were empty. The word catch fly generally refers to white, pink, red, or purplish flowers that have sticky stems and calices. And those are the sepals that form the protective layer around a flower in bud on which, as you can guess, small insects may become stuck. So I'm not sure what benefit that is to insects. We have these plants in Cameron, Hidalgo, and Willisee counties. Its native distribution is through the Southern United States, all the way from Florida west to, to California. At the same time as the catch fly event, another plant was maturing about five feet away at the Rosaka retaining wall. It had some blooms and was identified via iNaturalist as Mexican primrose willow. It, it likes Rosaka and canal banks, mainly in the southern half of Texas, so it's completely native. It's a host plant for banded sphinx moth, so it's a keeper, and popular with the insects for nectar and pollen. You can see it has an erect, airy growth with numerous flowers. It's an early morning bloomer, and the flowers begin clo closing around noon. It began looking rather dead toward the end of fall, and I thought, well, I might have to trim it up, but I looked at it around the first week of November and was delighted to see that new green growth was, was sprouting out. It's uh, reputed to be heavily receding, so it might have to be watched. Here's a photo showing the seed pods of that catch fly in front of the Mexican primrose. Now, a lot of stuff really wasn't weird, but this is just weird. One day in January this year, I practically stumbled over this bunch of yellow flowers at the top of our, our yard slope. And I was just going to ignore it because I just figured it was one of those three-lobe false mallow. However, I did a double take. 
I had the dickens of the time identifying these stunning flowers. The whole plant was so, uh, so tiny, I had to squat down and really view it and take photo after photo to get something really to be in focus. And there were all these fly-like, tiny, tiny fly-like things on the, the petals. Well, it's in the Brassicaceae, which is the mustard family. And someone on Native Plants of the Rio Grande Valley Facebook page suggested that it used to be in the Lusquerella genus, which led me to tentatively be able to identify, and I've identified it as rough pod, rough pod bladder pod. And I may be wrong, but if it is that, the entire plant disappears in summer when it gets really hot, and mine did. And according to Caesar Kleber Wildlife Research, white-tailed deer uh, can browse the leaves, flowers and fruit, scaled and bobwhite quail in their ranges uh, consume seeds. So I hope the plant returns because I'm still trying to get one more quail, well, more than one quail. So it attracted these little tiny fly-like fly -like things, honeybees, and then this wonderful calligrapher fly, if you can see that in the photo on the right. Not as vibrantly blooming, tropical amaranth is a plant that always seems to be around somewhere. And from what I can tell, it's native to both Texas and New Mexico. The leaves are green and they do have a lovely whitish watermark design to them. It's an annual and a prolific seed producer, but you really have to do a double take to realize it's blooming. As far as wildlife, perhaps seed eating birds use it, but it's not a plant that I particularly allow to mature. And not that it matters, as cautioned, it is prolific and it can, no matter if I mow it down or not, uh, their seeds are everywhere, even between the cracks of the sidewalk. So one spring day, I was mowing around a big ash tree and saw what looked like a too heavy caterpillar on a too spindly flower stem. And I did find this plant, uh, or I didn't find this plant elsewhere on our property that year, but I left what was left of it once the caterpillar did its thing, because obviously, it was host to the black swallowtail butterflies. I eventually identified it as Butler sand parsley by paging, again, page by page, through plants of deep South Texas. And if you wonder, my, my book is quite, quite thumbed, well-worn. Each year since, I have found more of these and more abundantly uh, elsewhere in our yard. And I leave them because of the caterpillars. It's generally gone by summer and it's native to South Central US and it's in the ca carrot family. Other black swallowtail larval food sources, if you experiment with growing vegetables and such are parsley, carrots, and members of the Ruticaceae family, like the herb rue, which is the picture on the top right of the slide with a, black, uh, a late stage black swallowtail caterpillar. Now you may not wanna try this at home. This is Virginia pepperweed. I know everybody sees these and you probably can name them or not, but you've grown up with them. And this is a childhood favorite of mine. My mom would let me take one little heart-shaped leaf, stick it on my tongue as we walked to dance class and back. So anyway, the plants are pollinated by a variety of insects and bees. The nectar and seeds are food sources too. It's a host plant for some of the whites, like the checkered white butterfly, and possibly a cabbage and great southern whites. I love this plant almost as much as the pepperweed. And it's an annual and it comes up in late winter here. Most people can name it, but only give it cursory consideration. It's red seeded plantain, uh, naturally occurs throughout much of Texas, the Great Plains and the Southwest. It grows from a short taproot, so you can pull it up, but I wouldn't. First, it shows a rosette of broad leaves close to the ground. Soon green spikes shoot up through the rosette that can reach to 14 inches in height. The spikes produce blooms, although the flowers are hardly noticeable. Toward the end of April and early May, hundreds, hundreds of tiny seeds turn the spikes rusty red color. This mostly ignored plant actually has a lot of value. It's used to revegetate wildlife habitats and rangelands for forage. The foliage is, written, is eaten by Rio Grande wild turkeys, white-tailed deer, cattle, Texas tortoise, scaled and bobwhite quail, and morning dove. 
It's been used as erosion control along streams in various parts of its range. It has been used, oh, I said that. The leaves have anti-inflammatory properties and I've held this in high regard from the time I watched a long ago episode of the television show, Walker, Texas Ranger. Perhaps you saw that, but our hero had suffered a dastardly knife wound during a fight and was left to die. Well, the bad guy rode away. Walker quickly regained consciousness, bravely plucked plantain leaves from the Texas landscape, chewed them to re release their mucilage, and then applied it to poultice to the stab wound to prevent infection. He was instantly healed, where he shape-shifted to an eagle and went on to save the day. Historically, that type of topical remedy has been well-documented, not for shape-shifting, but for treating all sorts of minor wounds. Red seed plantain may get only a casual glance, but it deserves respect. When you see one pushing its way up through the pavement uh, of your sidewalk, give it a nod and recognize it as a valued member of the Texas habitat. Common purslane is also another favorite. Its uh, value to wildlife is probably more than you ever thought or wanted to know, but it's a native succulent, an annual. It comes up from a taproot and does not root at the stem nodes. The flowers attract pollinators, flies, small bees, beetles, rodents, squirrels, rats, and mice eat the flowers. Sparrows and other birds eat the seeds. Herbivores eat the leaves. It is a larval plant to a variety of sawfly called the purslane botch, blotch mine, uh, and a larval host to the purslane moth, which is pictured at the bottom of the slide and from, the, uh, from my moth sheet this summer. At the bottom left it is a serenius blue butterfly drawing nectar. The insect on the top right is a uh, genus of midges. And I find this rather fascinating. One reason archaeology might be included in the Master Naturalist curriculum, for many years, botanists believed that this species was probably introduced uh, to North America from the Old World. But more recent evidence has pointed to the point to the idea that this plant has an ancient worldwide distribution. Some of the earliest explorers in the Americas found that the plant already grow it was growing and seeds of this plant have been found in archeological sites. Like wood sorrel, it's high in oxalic acid, toxic to cats, dogs, goats, and horses. It is remarkably maintenance free. It can come up between the cracks in a sidewalk and just take care of itself all summer long. It blooms spring through fall. One plant can produce up to 200,000 seeds. That's a lot of bird food. So we're nearly to the end. I wanted to include this plant. It's not a particularly popular plant. It's Indian Valley False Mallow, locally called cheeseweed. And it's in the mallow family. It grows on Ebony Loop in Harlingen's Hugh Ramsey Nature Park. I'd also noticed a fairly tall plant about waist high closer to the farmer's field next to our property for a couple of years. And then I found one on our property and kept it for a bio blitz. It's an annual native to Texas and Florida and perhaps a perennial here in the valley. I thought this colorful beetle was particularly exciting, although I've not seen one since, which is probably for the best. It's a species of wood-borne beetles and it was awfully close to a tree and our barn. So cheeseweed, is reputed to help the soil and furnish cover for some wildlife, which is really a rather nebulous attribute. At the top left slide, you can see how the inflorescence develops. On the downside, it's a host plant or cotton bollworm, which was worrisome because the cheeseweed plants I'd found were next to the farmer's cotton field. On the flip side, cheeseweed is a larval food plant for the striking Laviana white skipper butterfly. I do try to watch our, our uh, property pretty closely and I'm prepared to rip things out if it gets too, too uh, scary. The photo on the left shows the spent flowers of the cheeseweed. So this is my latest don't kill it till plant. I took the wheelie bin out to the side of the road one August morning for weekly collection. And I stopped short at the edge of the road where a dew drenched bright, bright green rosette of fleshy leaves was twinkling in the early morning light. I snapped a quick photo, uploaded it to natural or iNaturalist.org, and it was so surprised that, that it came back as desert 
horse per slain. Definitely a new one on me. The native distribution of this plant includes the southern half of the United States and Mexico. Unfortunately, I couldn't find anything nice about this plant. According to one source, it shows aliopathic effects on other weeds and crops, including sorghum, pumpkin, eggplant, radish, wheat, all the fun stuff. And by inhibit, excuse me, inhibiting seed germination and vigor of seedlings. The crop next to us at the time was sorghum. Fortunately, it's, it was eventually and quite successfully harvested last month. I did finally find one good use for this plant. It appears to be the larval host for the Hawaiian beet webworm moth that I find on the moth sheet in, in the summer months. But I can't find that that moth is particularly useful for anything. If the plant's aliopathic tendencies aren't bad enough, to further the horror story, each desert horse purslane plant, according to one source, produces more than 50,000 seeds in its lifetime, making what the source called dangerously invasive. Mysteriously, when I went out to that evening to retrieve the trash bin, there was no trace of the plant, absolutely no trace. I know it was there because the metadata on the phone camera doesn't lie. So that was most peculiar, probably for the best. Before I wrap this up, I debated quite a bit whether to include this plant because first of all, I didn't trust my research. It was just too unbelievable. Uh, the plant is Santa Maria feverfew or false ragweed. It's been called an aggressive colonizer. If you're familiar or you may be familiar with cabby.org, that is the Center of Agriculture and Biosciences International. It's a, com a compendium for worldwide invasive plants. Cabby calls this plant one of the 100 most invas invasive species in the world. Now, I certainly don't want to start man any mass hysteria, but in researching, I didn't find anything pleasant about it. The plant is probably native to Mexico and points south, but has expanded its range around the world, which is terrible news because it's been accused of becoming one of the most feared weeds on earth due to its health effects on humans and cattle. <clears throat> Asthma, bronchitis, dermatitis, and hay fever. I don't know if that's for the humans or the cattle or both. But as I said, it's an aliopathic and the effects on other plants and crops uh, information was according to gobotany.org. And a totally oblique Texas site agrees with those maladies and, and um, says, don't plant it. But that was the Texas Witchery website. And I'm not sure, but uh, it did mention that one of the attributes was you could use it for um, cursing and binding spells. So she's no saint, our Santa Maria fever few. And if Pan or anyone has anything different on this, please inform me. But that's what my research has shown. So on that, on that, I'm going to wrap it up with not two more slides, but two more plants. <clears throat> and it, it's two vines that everyone loves to hate. And do please realize I'm not trying to convert anyone to change their mind about these. I'm just stating some facts. And the first is the variable leaf snail seed. I naturalist calls it Mexican snail seed, but by whatever name, it's just as annoying unless you're a bug drawn to its nectar rich flowers or a bird when the fruit is ripe. It is dioecious, according to one source, that separate female and male plants, which may be why you think it always looks different when you're trying to identify it. The moniker, variable leaf, is true to its word. There is a variety in the leaf shapes. Variable leaf snail seed is native to Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, grandly. Its most annoying characteristic is that it's everywhere. The stem is thin, green, and tough as wire. It surreptitiously snakes through any upright plant it, can, plant it can find and travel around the green parts disguised until a tendril starts flowing out, and then you know it's there. <clears throat> but it does prefer, prefer the sturdy jungle gym of a chain link fence. You can clip the vines close to the ground and paint the, the cut with herbicide. But truthfully, this vine and the next one I'm going to talk about, once you get it, you've got it. They're everywhere and anywhere. However, 
The snail seed vine is host plant for the pretty monsoon moth, a tapestry looking moth named for its host plant, moon seed vine. And the snail seed vine is in the moon seed family. The vine also is a handy place for an afternoon assignation for a couple of Texas bolated bugs, but they could have met up anywhere. Lastly, in my opinion, the pesky of, of pesky possum grape, also called marine ivy, sorrel vine, grape ivy, and cowich vine. I naturalist calls it cowich vine. It's in the Bitacacea or grape family, but don't look to be making wine with it. It's pretty, I'll give you that. It has light green, sturdy, crisp, fleshy leaves, greenish umbrella shaped clusters of flowers that bloom uh, in late, late spring and summer and it attracts butterflies and the black shiny berries that mature in fall are eaten by birds. The vine stinks. If crushed or bruised, some say it smells like burnt rubber. I'm sure each of you, if you've had any experience with it, have your own um, fragrance analogies. The vine can cling or trail some 30 feet with a 10 foot spread. Personally, I think that's somewhat conservative. This vine, I think, would cover a small village if left unchecked. Now, I know I mentioned earlier that sometimes things get away from me. And this is a photo of four giant, I don't know how they got that big, Berlandier fiddlewoods that somehow got big and then got themselves draped with even a more amazing mass growth of possum grape vine. <clears throat> and yes, while I wasn't paying attention, like the Coryopsis that spring, this vegetative phenomenon seemed to happen overnight. The vine's habit is to hook onto plants, trees, fences, structures, and anything its path with curling tendrils. That said, it pulls away easily enough, coming down in great clumps when strenuously tugged. The fleshy, near succulent leaves seem to hold tons of moisture. An eradicated pile of the vine is quite heavy. Marine vine apparently is not eaten by animals, perhaps because of its smell, its foul smelling chemicals. Although, and Christina isn't here to confirm or deny, but I think one time she said that uh, raccoons may eat the berries or eat the leaves. It also has these huge tubers underground as big as somebody's arm and it will distribute more vines multi-directionally. There's good news though. A couple of years ago, I found a caterpillar eating the leaves of possum grape. I identified it, the one on the left, as a Wilson's wood nymph moth caterpillar. And during an April 2020 City Nature Challenge, I found the beautiful moth itself clinging to a, a, a shrub. And um, I've also had them visit my moth sheets. Other fun things that I found using post possum grape are the dotted lined white moth caterpillar Western honeybees and a cool looking inocellarus fly. And here's the best news. If you're a fan of Sphinx moths, possum grape is a larval host to at least three types, the mournful vine and satellite and the gaudy Sphinx in other parts of Texas. I really like the satellite Sphinx. It's gorgeous, a large moth, the one on the right, um, four and a half to five and a quarter inches. It's shaped like a stealth bomber and painted in Art Deco-esque geometric design in black and olive drab, drab. I could go on, but I won't. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll start giving your volunteer plants some thought. And just so you, in case you, you would like to know, you view the 119 photos of plants, moths, butterflies, and critters, 56 slides, 6,822 words that any broadcaster would have put into 114 60-second spots. 